Sam, I'm just going to oh, I've got that. I'm just going to share my screen so everyone can see. I've put some slides together, really, just as a way of kind of directing it a bit. I've got a few things to show you as well. So um, yes, as Sam said, my name is Laura Joyce, and I am a financial planner. And it's really lovely to be with you today. And it's interesting to see, actually, it's a real um, mix of people. So some people at Hayward House, and some people much wider afield. And I get the impression that most of you are business owners or working within a kind of um, a, a small business or a medium sized business, but also some employed people here as well. So hopefully I've got some information that will be useful to all of you. Um, but please, if you've got any questions, please feel free to note them down. And we can ask, answer those at the end. So in terms of today, oh, I'm just going to put it into slide um, slideshow mode. Here we go. So in terms of today, what I would like, let's move that up there, brilliant. So what I'd like to do is to really give you a brief history of pensions. Um, I seem to have turned into a bit of a pensions nerd and I was really interested to find out when pensions started. So I wanted to give you an idea of when pensions came into being and how they have changed over time. But then also to help you understand what different types of pensions are out there, because often a lot of the information we're given by pension providers is very confusing and often conflicting. And then for those people who run a business and have employees, just to touch on your options around corporate pensions. And then for all of us, I would like to talk around um, our personal pensions and how important they are and what we can do. And then I'll just summarise at the end with some key things that we can do personally to ensure that we arrive at retirement in the, uh, in, you know, as smoothly as possible and with the income we want. And I really hope you'll leave today with some clarity around pensions and some tips to help you with your own planning. So um, if that's okay, I will get started with a bit of an overview about myself. I um, am, as I said before, I'm a certified financial planner. So my job, and it's one I really love, is to help people really look forward and to come up with a plan as to how they're going to achieve their goals in life. And I'm talking financial goals in life. And it's not to say that I um, produce a plan that can't be changed. It's more about identifying the key uh, milestones in an individual's life and making sure that decisions are made along the way that will enable them to ultimately achieve those milestones. Retirement is a really common one, as I'm sure you can imagine. And um, there is so much uh, legis legislation and changes to that legislation that influence pensions and how people can actually afford retirement and lots of other kind of factors such as tax and in uh, investment returns and things like this. So it's really important that I help my clients to um, navigate their journey towards their milestones and in particular retirement. And as I said before, I absolutely love what I do. So um, the reason I love it is twofold. Um, I love chatting to people. So I have to be honest. Oh, sorry, Louise, do you have a question? You've got your hand up. I'm not quite sure if you have a question. Um, but I'll carry on. If you do, just please say. Um, so essentially, I love what I do because I get to ask lots and lots of questions. I'm not the kind of person who enjoys kind of small talk at a party, but I do really love getting down to the nuts and bolts of life and uh, finding out what people want to do with their lives and what, um, or I guess why, what, no, what's happened in their previous life to, to make that, that need there. So I get to talk to people, but I also have a demography degree. So I have a degree in population studies and, um, I feel that the work I do now really enables me to see um, trends in society and how both careers and pensions and kind of aspirations have changed over time and how they are reflected in um, the decision making process that we go through. And I really enjoy that element of what we do. So moving on. First of all, let's start with our history of pensions. So the first pension I was really interested to hear about came into being in 1909. And um, it was a very small pension. It was about 10 pence. Um, and you didn't necessarily get it unless you were considered of good character, 
which seems quite harsh, but um, I don't quite know how they actually worked out who was good enough. But uh, fingers crossed, we would have all been in that pot. Then obviously pensions moved forward and we got to the end of the Second World War and actually the state pension came in for everybody. So it moved away from being of good character and even those who were not of good character were entitled to the state pension from 1946. Move forward again and 1988, we have the personal pensions coming in. Now, my colleague, um, she remembers this really, um, she's uh, slightly older than me and she remembers it uh, the idea of personal pensions being brought in and how it was a very big, um, a big thing within the financial sector. And it was really the first encouragement um, that individuals should or could start taking more control of their retirement income, and they were being encouraged to do so. Move forward again, and we're at 2012, and this is when auto-enrolment um, happened. And as employers or employees, I'm sure you know plenty about auto enrolment. But this was the government really saying, no, individual pensions are really key now. We cannot rely on the state provision for pensions that will be there, but not to cover all pension requirements. And it really is um, a, a big shove by the government to make individuals um, start saving for pensions. And then finally, in 2014, we found that pension freedoms um, came in. And this was a change in the law as around how uh, an individual who had a pension could access that money. And it has significant implications for a lot of people. And there was a lot of fear around it. So they are the main pension events. And obviously within that, there's loads of kind of like smaller changes. But um, obviously pensions have been around for a long time. So in terms of the retirement, in oh, sorry, Sam, do you want to say something? I'm only going to pass on Louise's comment, which was that she suggested that we could all turn our video off if we wanted to, because it would save bandwidth. However, I won't, because I don't want to ruin anything. And you shouldn't, because we won't see you. Okay, um, so it's people's own choice. And just to let you know that the screen is showing um, half the size of a full screen. Mm. Okay, well, let's try and sort that out. How do we do? Is that any better? Yeah, yeah, it's better. You know, the first time you did it when we tried it before in prep, it was completely full. And mm. now it's just there are a few um, instructions around the edge, but it's not a big problem. Okay, well, as long as you can see it, that's yeah. the main thing. Yeah. So thank you, Sam. So if we go back and say, well, actually, over time, Retirement income, if you think about it, not as pensions, but as retirement income, how has that been provided? So really, at the turn in at 1900s onwards, the state pension started, and that would have been the main pension, the main source of income for people in their retirement. And for those who could afford it, they would have added to that with their own savings but also um, families would have been expected to contribute towards um, the care of people who were unable to work. And undoubtedly, people who could not afford to stop work just carried on working. But the state pension provision has reduced significantly as a proportion of retirement income. So actually, we're now we're kind of stepping into an area where the workplace pension has become increasingly important. And it did provide a good amount of our um, retirement income. I know from the people who are now in their 70s, that kind of age, 70s, 80s, who had final salary pensions from their workplaces. It's a good level of income that they got from their workplace pension. And that was key um, as a combination of that and their state pension in providing their retirement income. But I think we've now stepped forwards again, and actually the workplace pension as a proportion of our retirement income has reduced significantly. And there's reason for that. So we've now got to the point where we are really needing to consider personal pensions in terms of providing for ourselves in the future, making sure that we have state pension, we have a workplace pension, and we have a personal pension to provide retirement income is going to be key. 
Okay. So if we move on again, so that's the history. But I'm sure that all of you have heard of different um, terminology used for pensions. So I just wanted to clarify the three different types of pensions that are actually out there. So first of all, we have the state pension. So at the moment, the state pension in, in its fullest is worth just over £9,000 a year. So it's not insignificant. If you think if you're in a couple and you're both retiring, actually for a household, that's £18,000 if you've got the full qualifying years of 35. So you have to be paying NIC, so national insurance contributions, for 35 years in order to qualify for this full state pension. And I would really recommend um, actually checking your state pension forecast and making sure that you have got the number of years you're entitled to. So again, I can provide a link for that. So um, obviously the access age is increasing and um, it will be 67 for everyone born from 1961 onwards. And one of the most important things about the state pension is it's, it's um, protected. So it's protected by the triple lock and that's uh, quite a common term that's thrown around when it comes to the state pension. And what that means is that actually the state pension should increase by the highest of inflation, average earnings, or 2.5%. So just to give you an idea, inflation is currently 4.2%, and it'd be really interesting to, to see um, what the government do about trying to increase the, the state pension to make sure it's in line with inflation. So that's the state pension. We also have defined benefit pensions, and these are also known as final salary pensions. And these were typically provided by workplace workplaces in that kind of period of kind of the 80s, 90s. British Gas, for example, they provided a final salary pension, but they're extremely um, expensive to provide. And that's because a final salary pension provides you, the um, beneficiary, so the person who's done the work, with a guaranteed income for life. So you live until you're 108, like my friend's grandma did, they will pay you an agreed amount of money for until you die. And if you die with a surviving dependent, so that might be a spouse or a child who is still dependent, so under 18, then they will provide a reduced income for that individual. So as you can imagine, for a company to provide that, to provide a guaranteed level of income for an unknown period of time, that is very expensive. And that is why lots of companies have moved away from these. They are now very few and far between. Lots of companies have stopped them and moved their employees into a different type of pension. So now the most common ones are obviously NHS teachers pension, the university superannuation scheme, um, civil service, they have a, um, a final salary pension. So they're very, they're becoming rarer, but they are very good pensions. They are increased over time. So um, they try and keep you in line with inflation. So your buying power with the money you get is, um, is still there, but that indexation does vary. And if you want to know whether or not you have a defined benefit pension, I recommend pulling your statement out from that drawer I know, right at the bottom of your desk where lots of people put their pension information and look for um, the acronym CETV, which is the cash equivalent transfer value. Look for terms like final salary, annuity, post-death post retirement benefits. These are words that are generally associated with defined benefit pensions. And then the final type of pension, because there is only three, is a defined contribution pension. And these are the pensions that lots of companies who provided the defined benefit pension have swapped their employees into. And these are the most common type of pensions. We are the ones that we have through a personal arrangement and most workplace schemes. And they're also known as money purchase pensions. And what you're doing here is you are basically creating a pot of money and it gets bigger and bigger, hopefully, over the years. And at some point, you don't have to, but you, you know, if you don't have to take money from a pension, but you can, when you get to the point of wanting to retire, either buy an annuity, which is an income for life, or you can draw down from it a 
bit like you would from a bank account. Not quite, but a bit like that. And you get 25% of it tax free. And then the rest is taxed at your highest marginal rate. So these are the most common type of pensions. And I would recommend if you're getting out those, uh, those statements, have a look for words such as stakeholder, personal pension or with profits. So hopefully from that, you can kind of get a bit of an idea as to what you've got. And I would not be surprised. Hopefully we've all got the state pension because we're all working. But I wouldn't be surprised if you have several defined contribution pensions and maybe the odd defined benefit pension. It would just depend on your career history. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what's out there. But really what I want to touch on now, because we are you know, business owners and employees, are corporate pensions. And what is there? You know, what do we need to think about when it comes to corporate pensions? So we know that auto enrolment came into being in 2012, and it has been kind of rolled out over a series of years. And as an employer, it will be no um, surprise to you that you must, through auto enrolment, provide a pension for all eligible staff members. You must, and you must um, provide a pension for anybody who is not eligible but requests a pension. And you must re-enroll your staff every three years. Now, this is really a way of ensuring that everybody, as many people as possible, have pensions. They're starting at a young age to really start to develop that pension pot. And the auto enrolment schemes are cheap. They are very um, basic pensions, but they are they're kind of mass produced pensions, if you like, and they serve a good purpose. So you'll often come across uh, auto enrolment schemes such as NEST. Now pensions, um, the people pension, people's pension, and then also a lot of the high street providers. So Aviva, Scottish Widows, Standard Life and Royal London all provide an auto enrolment scheme. And there's a real place for those for those schemes out there. Now, none of, all, none of that would be a surprise to people who have employees. But what I wanted to talk about was really. How can you support your employees to get more out of their, of their auto enrollment scheme? So, and if you have one yourself, what can you do to get more out of it? And I think it comes down to knowing your pension. I come across a lot of um, situations where employees have an auto enrollment scheme, but they've been put into the default fund. So their money has just been invested into a a fund um, which will include some equities, it includes some um, bonds, it'll include a few different things, but it's often very low risk. And if that employee is in their 20s, in their 30s, then that is not necessarily appropriate for their life plan. It's not making the most of their money. And I feel there's a real need to ensure that employees know their options. It's very easy to change the, your fund selection within a pension plan and to make sure you're getting en enough out of your money it's working hard for you so actually considering is there some financial education available to us that we can use to support our employees is is i think a really um good benefit to be given uh, as a as a, a company owner and i can point you in the direction of financial education providers if that helps so also, the auto enrollment schemes are, they're very cheap and they're, they're, there's nothing wrong with them at all, but they are cheap and they don't necessarily give the best level of return. But they are provided so that people who cannot necessarily afford a more expensive pension can have a pension and can do that retirement saving. And that's why they're really key. But you may find that more senior staff members would benefit and could afford to have a slightly more expensive pension that makes them more of their money. It makes their money work harder because they are paying for somebody to be involved. And I'll try and explain that a bit more um, next. So when it comes to investing, you've got a spectrum. You've got passive investing and you've got active investing. And there's a difference between them. So passive investing is where your money is invested into the investment markets and it follows the FTSE. It, it goes, you know, the markets and the FTSE in, this, in our case goes up 
your money goes up. If it puts you in the markets go down, your money goes down. And at the most passive le level, because it is a spectrum, your money um, will be in a tracker. And you may well see that in your pension statement. It'll be in a tracker fund. And what that means is that essentially your money goes in and a fund manager will be paid to check on the money and maybe look at the fund, make some adjustments. And then that won't happen again for at least another three months. And that means that therefore it's cheap because you're not paying for much manpower when it comes to a passive investment. And when the markets are very flat and nothing's happening, then that works brilliantly. There's a real place for those. But if you're in a more volatile experience, like we have been over the last few years, well, uh, for more, maybe a bit more than that, but we may well be going forwards because of climate change, you would benefit from having somebody look at your money on a much more frequent level or basis. So active is around, they are slightly more expensive, but you have a fund manager going in and looking at your money on a regular basis. And I, that's a daily basis. So when your money, when the markets are going up, they're looking at how can we improve that increase? How can we make sure the increase lasts for as long as possible? What can we be doing to, you know, to actively take control of this? And when the markets go um, down, the fund managers are looking at what can they do to stem the flow, if you like? How can prevent our clients' money from going as low as the markets? Because actually, the lower that you go, the further you've got to climb up the other side. And this is really prevalent in COVID times. So when we had the COVID crash on the 24th of March, 2020, was that all? Gosh, um, the FTSE fell by 30%, which is a huge amount of money. Uh, well, huge amount, depending on how much you've got invested, but it's a huge drop. And what we found was with that active um, funds, I work in the active area and our funds only fell by like 12%, which is a still, it's substantial, but it's not 30%. And that's because the fund managers are in there. They are preventing the falls. And that's the difference between passive and active investing. So when it comes to pensions and we look at the auto enrollment schemes and where do they sit in the kind of um, spectrum? Well, they're on the passive side and it is a spectrum. So I've kind of just made some kind of generalizations here, but you know, something like NEST, which is the government supported um, auto enrollment scheme, and now pensions, they're on the more passive side. And as we move along, we find things like Royal London, Fidelity International. And I work under the um, umbrella of St. James's Place, and that is an active investment provider. So going back to my uh, kind of previous bullet point, it may be that more senior people within your organization or any organization would actually see the opportunity to have a, a more actively managed pension as a real benefit. And actually, the auto enrollment schemes are fantastic and they should be used for the right people. But there are options to people who would like a more active approach. Sam. Sorry, Laura. I've had a couple of, well, one person has said that their sound is dropping in and out. Okay. Another person has said that their sound wasn't very good, but they restarted and it's fine now. So I don't know if you want to check with everybody or if anyone wants to let us know if they're having problems. Yeah. Is anyone needing to go in and out? It's fine here. Steve, what are you saying? I can't hear you very well, actually. Steve said he was fine. Oh, did he? Okay, he's fine. Okay. Is anyone else having a problem or are we okay to carry on? Or I'm does anyone want to let us know? We're good here. Okay. Okay, well, if no one else has got anything to say, then I guess we can continue. At the moment, mm -hmm. it seems oh, Tamsin saying she's logged out and logged back in. Okay. It seems okay now, she says. Okay, we're well, sorry for the interruption. No, no, you're fine. Okay. You're fine. All right. So essentially what we're saying is um, corporately you are um, required to provide for your employees, and that's quite right. But there are options out there both to improve their, the auto-enrollment -enroll scheme that 
individuals are receiving or invested into, but also to consider other options out there as well. So as I mentioned earlier, personal pensions are becoming an increasingly important part of our retirement income provision. And so uh, I'd like to touch on now a bit more about personal pensions. So personal pensions are for everybody. They are for people who are employed, people who do not work. So including um, you can invest into a personal pension even if you don't have a job. Um, sole traders, people who are directors of companies, they are for employees who have opted out of the workplace scheme. Or they're also for employees who have maximised the employer contribution available to them. So they're really, they're out there for everybody. But as an advisor, I would always have to do certain checks to make sure that the individual is maximising any pension contribution provision that's available elsewhere before approving that they could have one. And, and as um, a personal um, contributor, you are entitled to a 20% immediate tax relief on all your contributions. Um, uh, by way of example, if you put in £400 a month, you will see £500 per month invested into your pension. And it's the, you're getting growth on that 500 If you are a higher rate taxpayer or above, you will receive a further 20% tax relief, which is available through your self-assessment um, and coming back through your tax code. So that 20% doesn't go into your pension, but the first 20% does. Now, we're often asked, how much can you put into a pension? Well, you can put as a personal, uh, well, it kind of works on the work and on the corporate and on the personal side with a few discrepancies. But um, generally, the rule is you can receive tax relief on contributions up to £40,000. And that includes the tax relief. So we're looking at contributions of 24000 if you're making them personally. And that's in one year. But that assumes you earn more than £40,000. If you earn less than this, you can contribute up to your um, level of earnings. So if you earn £25,000, you are entitled to put £25,000 into a pension, including the tax relief, in one tax year. Now, there are there is a rule which allows you to use your allowance, so that's the, um, the £40,000 or similar that I've been talking about, that you haven't used from previous years. So actually, if you are building up money in your business, if you um, have come into a pot of money and you're not sure what to do with it, you want to use it in a tax efficient manner, you can actually go beyond your annual allowance within a pension and use previous year's allowances. So it's always worth a conversation with somebody who can advise you and do the calculations for you. And you can access personal pensions at the moment from age 55. Now, in 2028, that changes to 57. And basically, uh, what it does is it remains, you can access a personal pension 10 years before the state pension. So they're trying to keep that gap at the 10 year mark. Now, when it comes to um, your options on a personal pension, again, it's a bit like a workplace pension. Look around, I do encourage you to look around and consider the different pension types available to you and the different providers. Because the same principle uh, applies to a personal pension as it does to a corporate pension. You may have um, personal pensions sat in the um, passive environment, which may have been fine at the time, but actually, are you better off now looking more in the active side of things? So it really, it's about seeing what have you got and not feeling that you've got to stay with what you've got. There might be something better out there for you that might work harder for you, and it might give you um, a wider range of access options. So not all pensions will allow you to access your money in the same way. And it's important to make sure that you have a pension that allows you to do it exactly the way that's going to work for you. Lots of people consolidate pensions. So when you have several, and I've seen uh, people with a lot, maybe like nine pensions, that is an awful lot to um, a minister, particularly when you get to retirement. And there's always the fear of, my gosh, have I forgotten one? So lots of people take the approach that they consolidate their pensions into one pot with one provider, and that helps them administer 
um, their pensions much more easily. And I would also encourage you to um, look up any assets you have that could go into a pension. So for example, commercial property, woodland, they can all sit within pensions. And depending on your circumstances, there are ways of doing this. And that could really help boost your pension pot. Um, also, I would encourage you to look when it comes to personal pensions, kind of the bitterness side, uh, what other income streams you have that are available for you to use in retirement? Because it's not necessarily just about using a personal pension or a workplace pension. You may well have um, a business sale, a business you can sell just prior to retirement, and then that will give you a level of income. So we're nearly there. I just so basically we've gone through kind of the history of pensions, what pensions are out there. As a corporate provide, um, pension provider, you know, what are your responsibilities in terms of your employees and how can you improve their situation? And again, as a, an individual, what can you do? What are your choices when it comes to pensions? But really what I wanted to do now was to just pick up on what can you do to make sure you actually get the retirement you want? And from an employer perspective, I go back to the point again, it's just checking in with your employees and making sure that they understand their pension options. What can they do within their auto enrollment scheme to improve the fund selection, to make sure their funds are working hard? Is it the right pension for them? But on a personal level, there's loads of things you can do now. So I really encourage you to spend time thinking about the retirement you want. Retirement, I think, has certain connotations in terms of the word, but actually, I think, oh, was it Angela used um, a term before that I really liked about retirement? What, Angela, what was it? It was rewirement. Rewirement. Is that how, explain a bit about that. Well, how, I think I was a little bit frustrated because when I was, you know, I, I, I suppose I could say I was retired from 55. Yeah. And what I meant was I, I actively chose to, you know, to, to end my, you know, drug development career. And so by saying to people that I was retired, just, you know, it's not really about flopping around in a pair of slippers, you know, looking for the best, um, you know, funeral plan at all. You know, it's not that at all. You know, I'm still very active, still got a good mind, still want to contribute. But that kind of word retirement didn't really sort of say how I felt, I guess. Mm. Um so I began to think of a different word. And really, I think when you kind of outside of a structured work environment, you do need to completely rethink your approach to pretty much everything. And I, and in a positive way, that's been fantastic, but it is a different mindset. And I think that kind of rewiring your brain to find new purpose, to understand, you know, what your identity is now, to, um, you know, rethink your social interactions, yeah. you know, all those kind of, you know, life stuff, I think that you don't normally associate with retirement really does need to be looked at. So, you know, resetting your mindset yeah. to life now beyond the, you know, the long-term career, I think has been really useful. That's, I, I just love the term. I, I can imagine it makes so much sense because it's a, I mean, retirement has always got the connotations, hasn't it? Of, like you say, just like putting your slippers on and watching daytime TV. But actually, it can be whatever you want it to be. It's just another phase. And it's so important that we all spend time considering what that could look like and not to find it off-putting, but to see it as a real opportunity. Yeah. And actually, it could well be a different career path. So Absolutely. I'm definitely seeing with my clients that you know people who haven't been saving for retirement – um, potentially or haven't had the opportunity to they you know they will actually have a phased period of their life where they'll work a bit they might not work a bit you know it's just going to be a really interesting patch and I'm all for the idea of um, changing having a bit of rewiring uh, at that stage in your life so I'll be going there definitely and then I would really encourage you to uh, to consider that when you stop having a regular salaried role or a reduced salaried role, what level of income do you really need? So somewhere between, we would recommend 50 to 80% of your current income is a good place to start. And I would actually just start trying on the numbers and seeing what, it, what it's like. You might be like, gosh, no, that's too much. No, what about this? Could I live on this? 
just giving yourself some ideas as to what you would actually need in your next phase of life. And then looking to review the arrangements you've got. So get those statements out of the drawer. What are they going to give you and when are they going to give it to you? What does your state pension forecast look like? So to check your state pension forecast, you just need to go to the government website and look for um, forward slash check dash state dash pension. And I promise you, if you've got a government gateway account, it is really, really straightforward. And you can always buy missing years for the state pension. And that's definitely worth considering. There's a way of working out whether or not it's worthwhile. And then consider where your pensions are currently invested. Are you in the passive area or can you look to move them into a more active area and get more from your pensions? Seek advice. There are lots of financial planners out there. I'm sure you've come across plenty of yourselves. So seek advice, ask questions, because there may well be um, ways of accessing money, ways of dealing with money that make things much more tax efficient and actually work better for you. If you're able to, contribute early and regularly into your pension or other savings. Because of compound interest, so growth on growth has a big effect. And therefore, even if you're only putting small amounts in, it is all contributing to the long term kind of growth of your your, um, savings. And then make use of your pension tax, um, well, pension allowances and tax relief. And they're the things I was talking about before. So making sure if you have excess money that you make use of unused allowances from the previous three tax years. So looking at how much can I put into my pension and how much have I put in over the last three years? And equally, if you've got um, money available to make a personal contribution, then actually there's tax relief available to you. And that tax relief makes a huge difference. And then the most key point, which is why I put it in bold, is to review your retirement planning regularly. It's a really essential part of what I encourage people to do. If you know where you're going and you're looking at that on on an annual basis, then you can make changes as and when is needed. So I really encourage you to do that. So they're just kind of a few kind of things I would be checking off my list to make sure I've done. But I've actually arranged to pop into Hayward House. I know you're not all at Hayward House, but I can always meet people elsewhere. But um, on the 6th of December, which is a Monday, and I'm having a drop-in session, and it's just half an hour slots, and anybody is welcome to come and book a slot and come and have a free chat with me just to talk through any questions you may have, any queries, um, any thoughts. And I'm, you know, as I said at the start, I just love chatting to people. So I'm more than happy to talk about anything, in fact. So if you would like to come and have a chat with me, I will be available um, two to four on the 6th of December. And if you could just um, email julie.harnett at sjpp.co.uk, she will be able to book a slot for you. So that pretty much concludes what um, I wanted to say. Um, In terms of next steps, I just encourage you all to give some thought to what you would like to happen in the future for yourselves and to really think about what provision you've got now. Um, I'm always available for a chat. If you're not able to come to the drop-in session, please feel free to contact me. And um, yeah, I'd I'd love to hear from you. So that's it, Sam. Thank you, Laura. That was was great. So it's um, very well presented and lovely and clear and really interesting. I didn't realise the pers- that the state pension was what it is, actually, and I'm going to go and have a look at gov.uk.check.not.slash state pension. But, yeah, really interesting. Um, before I might ask any questions, is there any questions that anyone else would like to ask um, who has been... We're all on mute at the moment, so you have to take yourself off mute or do a hand reaction if you know how to do that. I only learned it the other month. <laughs> Um, because I missed the beginning, will we get a copy of the note with the, the slides, Laura? Is that okay? Yeah, of course, that's fine. I can send the slides out, no problem. Thank you. Or will uh, we get uh, a copy uh, of the recording, Sam? 
Yes, it's all recorded. So um, it will go up on our Haywood House YouTube channel and I will email everybody with the slides that Laura sends to me, plus the link to the YouTube channel. OK. Yeah, thank you. Did anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? Well, I was just wondering, maybe someone can jump in, just please put it, do a reaction with a hand or yell if you'd like to speak. Um, you mentioned several things that we could do to prepare for the time when we stop work, Laura. If you had to pick one in particular, what would that be? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good question. I think um, I, per, for me personally, it is going in and doing that regular review. So making sure that you know where the information is that you have. So where are your pensions? So you're not scrabbling around at a later date. You have the information together, you're understanding the statements and you're then able to review those. So you could even just keep you know, a simple spreadsheet saying, right, at the moment, income starting at this age is going to be X, Y, and Z. Added together, this gives me a total of this. What is it that I need to be doing to either improving that or maintaining it or changing it in some way? And so it is that regular review that I think is so key. It's staying, it's a stay engaged, isn't it, with the subject? Yeah, I think I loved your list actually of bullet points. You know that that planning bit does mm. sort of make it always even a lot more exciting. You know, it's very projects, exciting. Projects to get your head around, like another, as, <laughs> as Angela was saying as well, sort of an almost another, well, not necessarily career, but another stage of your life that actually mm. can be fun and an adventure. Yes, absolutely, yeah, and it's. It it's having that daydream, isn't it, about what you want it to look like and do you want to travel and, you know, what, what is it that really makes you feel excited about that period of your life? Mm. Yeah, no, well, and I would say that another um, point that I would pick up on then is to get in touch with someone like yourself, and that isn't a sales ploy, but whoever it may be, mm. to then discuss all of all of the details of that plan in line with all your sort of own bullet points for your adventure um because it does just seem like this static pile of paper that you just haven't well for me that you don't understand or yeah. realize that there are exits other ways to invest yeah. you know other things things that you can get now and save later and all those sorts of options that um, you might not even realize that you have that's so true and yeah. as business owners it's really important to consider do you have a sellable aspect to your business because i had a conversation with somebody i think only the other day who is so busy entrenched in the business they hadn't actually thought about oh I've actually generated this amazing asset that could really support me in the future if I take appropriate steps in my exit mm. and it's just you know those kind of those little things are so important mm. yeah so a pension I mean that jumps out at me too so, so a pension isn't necessarily a pension plan mm. it could be assets or completely. whatever yes completely that's so true um, and that was interesting as well about the passive and active. Um, mm. I mean, again, I had no idea. And that you could even think about you might switch from one to the other once you realise which you had. Yeah. Um, how did the investment approach taken influence the level of risk? Is one approach more risky than the other? Yes. So I think that is an, that is an important differentiation, differentiation between the two. So a passive investment your whilst you may not get a very or might not always get a very good return it is much less risky uh, as you move into a more um, active approach it is slightly more risky because um it's because it is active you're getting but because if you get um because it's higher risk you get a higher return essentially but it's not risky as in I don't know, gamble, you know, I'm not, it's not out of, you know, it's not un unreasonable risk, but there is, you know, you do go through a slight transition mm -hmm. and it's important for people to understand that as well. But um, that's why you tend to have advice on the active side because you potentially, you need somebody there just to make sure that it's staying as you need it to stay and not getting unduly risky. Um, right, yeah, thank you. And I've got a question from Mark as well. And just staying with that very tiny quickly, it was kind of encouraging and reassuring that you did mention with the state pensions that, well, A, that there's something that, you know, that protects the value of them and that they mm -hmm. they are reviewed. And also that people actually are doing something on your ones that are invested because you don't imagine that anyone's really doing anything. 
but yes. I won't hang on in there. That was just reassurance because Mark mm. has asked what form of a pension or what form of pension would be best for a commercial property? So um, a commercial property can sit in a SIP. So it would just there's a process that has to go through. So a SIP is a self-invested pension plan. And I take it I've understood Mark correctly, but if, if you own the commercial property or you're going to own the commercial property, that can be purchased using existing pension funds and potentially a mortgage within the pension. And then the property is rented either to yourself or to another um, to someone else who's using it. And that income goes straight into your pension. So it becomes a very tax efficient approach. And so then you get growth on that income and it goes on from there. So, um, yeah, using a, a SIP is the key thing with commercial property and woodland. Does that answer your question, Mark, at least at this point? Or would you like to ask anything else? I'll wait to see a, a chat note. Um, no, no, that was that was perfect. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. OK. Does anyone else have any questions? I think we've got one last one here. Um, you hear lots of stories about people with final salary pensions transferring out of these. Mm. Um, just thinking of Lloyd's employees in particular, is that an option for everyone with a final salary pension? Yeah, so I think that's, um, because we've been talking about defined benefit pensions, I think it's important, very important aspect to mention. So, you often, I, I know, I, I, get, I get lots of people coming to me and saying, well, my friend down the road managed to transfer out of, um, they all, because I'm, I'm Bristol based, they all seem to be Lloyds, but um, there's a, a moving out of their final salary pension. And that is, in lots of cases, a good thing to do. Um, and, but it's not in every case, because you're giving up a guaranteed income, it's essential that there is a very careful process that you go through, a very cautious process you go through to make sure it's the right thing for you to do. You do benefit, particularly when it comes to death benefits, from moving out of a final salary pension. But the give up is the give up of that um, guarantee is enormous and it's a really tightly regulated area. And I think what we're noticing is the number of people transferring out is decreasing, maybe because there's fewer of the pensions. Um, and, um, and also the regulations around it are getting tighter because it is such a big deal. So it might be appropriate for some, but it's definitely not appropriate for everybody. Okay, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Um, obviously, Laura, um, Laura has offered the half an hour slot for anybody whether you'd like to come to Hayward House, which is in Westbury and Wiltshire, um, for that slot. And uh, Laura has a date booked for a meeting room or, as she said, if you can't do that because you're in Exeter, um, I can't remember the other places now, there was Devizes in Temple Cloud. Um, mm -hmm. They're not quite so far away, but Laura obviously will be happy to hear from you to, to have a half hour to go through anything you'd like to. Um, so that's all there for you to get. And, and we will send around the slides. So you can have the details of contacting Laura again. Um, any more questions out there? Oh. Well, hello? Angela? No, no. I was going to ask a very cheeky question. <laughs> My cheeky question was going to be, we've heard a lot through COP26 about one mm -hmm. thing that you can do as an individual to mm -hmm. um, impact climate change is to, is to be aware of where your pension mm -hmm. pot is being invested and whether the, those investments are ethical, green, da da da. I don't know what's, what's your view on, on that, Laura. Is that, is that a, a, a real idealised situation? Um, is it reality? Is it possible? It's definitely possible. Um, I think there's been a massive shift. So um, I think until, I don't know, a few, a few years ago, it felt like there was, there was investing and then there was green investing it, or ethical investing, and it was very separate. Whereas now what I'm noticing is that the two things are starting to merge and the companies that, you know, the well-known companies, take St. James's Place as an example, they're an investment company, but they are now taking on the ethical approach to investing, and it's becoming absolutely central to company um, policy. 
And I suspect the same is true for a lot of providers out there. So whereas before you may exclude certain pe- certain companies um, for investing in them, so obvious ones would be like tobacco or arms or something like this, we're now looking at positive inclusion, which is around selecting companies who are making um, who are taking steps to take like active steps to make an improved um, situation for the future. So are they investing in um, eco technology in the future? And they, you know, so something like I don't take Tesla as an example. There's much more inclusion of things like that rather than exclusion of things like tobacco. So it's, it feels like the whole um, kind of ethical investing thing has kind of matured a bit and it's now available to, I believe it's available to everybody and we all have a choice over being able to do that. And again, that's another reason to have a good look at your pension statements. And perhaps you'll always be able to see the fund um, name on your pension statement. You can put that into Google and you should be able to find, often through Trustnet, um, you should be able to find information about who the main um, shares are with in that fund. And that will give you an idea as to how ethical it is. Thanks very much, Laura. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it, it's a couple of minutes till one, so uh, one, no, two, in fact. Um, so thank you all for being here, and we will pass on the slides and the link for the video to watch it again. And thank you, Laura, um, for the talk. Um, I don't know if you'd like to just finish up before we oh. wrap up. Well, it's just to say thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been I, I love talking about pensions and I love talking about actually the question about ethical investing is really important and I enjoy talking that kind of thing through. I'm always happy just to chat if anyone would like to. And um, yeah, just to say, have a good afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine. It is, it's really sunny in Bristol. So I hope it is with you. Thank you. OK, well, we'll all be in touch with, with each other as we'd like. Thanks very much, everyone. Ah, thanks very much, Sam. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.